Cleveland Clinic. I'm very excited, very excited to have this uh, event. Let me uh, briefly introduce uh, our panel of moderators and speakers. We have Dr. Oh, yeah. Diego. We have Dr. Diego Davila, uh, who is a hepatobiliary uh, surgeon at uh, University uh, CES in Medellin, Colombia. He's going to be one of our moderators today. We have Dr. Eloy Ruiz, who is a hepatobiliary surgeon as well at the Institute uh, National Institute of ne uh, Oncologic uh, Diseases in uh, Lima, Peru. And then the speakers, uh, Dr. Karen Pineda Solis, who is at University of Rochester. She's a liver transplant and hepatobiliary surgeon. She will be talking about when to resect advanced HCC. We have Dr. Parisa Tabrizian. She's a liver transplant and hepatobiliary surgeon at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York. She will be talking about when to refer to transplantation. We have Dr. Bruno Odicio. He's a interventional radiologist uh, at MD Anderson, and he will be talking about liver-directed therapy. And we have Dr. Sunil Kamath. He's a medical oncologist here at Cleveland Clinic, and he will be talking about uh, systemic therapies for hepatocellular carcinoma. Let me briefly remind you about the format of the program. The talks will last each uh, uh, 15 minutes. We'll go through the four talks. And then the last uh, 15 minutes will be dedicated for uh, uh, discussion and answering questions. So without further ado, I will go ahead and uh, uh, let Dr. Karen Pineda Solis start her presentation with uh, about when to resect advanced HCC. Karen, thank you so much. You can start sharing your screen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you see my screen well? Yes, we can. Perfect. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks, American HPV, for the invitation of this webinar. I'm going to talk about when to resect advanced hepatocellular carcinoma. It's one of the most commonly diagnosed cancer in the world and is uh, the third leading cause of cancer related deaths worldwide. It's expected in 2025 to have around 1 million of deaths related to HEC globally. It's a tumor that trend to develop in the background of cirrhosis, but it's still like 20 or 30% of the patients do not present cirrhosis. And it's a tumor also has a lot of propensity to invade vascular structures like portal vein, hepatic veins and IDC, but the most common is portal vein is a fearful complication for HEC. So there is no universal system or definition for advanced HEC. However, all of the characteristics are the ideas to determine survival. So some centers utilize the size, the extension of the adjacent uh, structures or the presence of metastasis. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to define uh, you know, advanced HEC using the Barcelona Clinic Liver Cancer. This algorithm has been mostly adopted by the Europeans and also from Americans. And as you can see, they define advanced HEC, like any tumor with portal vein invasion, the presence uh, and the metastasic disease. And as you can see, the first line of treatment suggested is a systemic therapy and they were also available in these patients are 17 months. So far, there is a lack of consensus of the management of HEC in different stages. But in this table, we can compare the different treatments among, among the guidelines around the world. As you can see, then HEC is a very heterogeneous population. We have patients with metastasis and others with portal vein invasion. I see in the overall consensus, we can say the metastasic disease needs to go to systemic therapy, and we are not going to focus in that part in my talk. We are going to talk more in patients with portal vein invasion. You can see comparing all the guidelines here, especially in countries in Asia like Japan, China, and Korea, in the guidelines they include resection in these tumors. So again, we are going to remove these patients for, uh, with metastatic disease, um, focusing portal vein invasion, 
However, the portal vein tumor thrombosis is, has been the bottleneck of the treatment because not all the thrombosis are the same. So the, the tumor thrombosis can be presented in around 50% of the cases and overall the prognosis is very poor, being a survival for two or four months without treatments. And, you know, with a systemic therapy with sorafenib with a SHARP study, the survival increased very modestly just three months and is the base for the Barcelona to utilize these um, guidelines. So what about the implications on clinical trials uh, you know, around the world? There are a lot of heterogeneity of HEC in the terms of biology, epidemiology, and geography. So it's very complex, so it's almost impossible to have a randomized controlled trial. If we compare you know, the East countries, uh, there are more incidence, incidence of hepatitis B, uh, these populations trying to have, you know, vertical transmission and patients trying to be younger versus in, you know, American Europe, um, most of the cases present with hepatitis C or alcohol, um, the patients are older. And now we are having more patients with NASH uh, with the um, uh, epidemic of obesity. But you can see there are basically two different populations. In the sense, you know, in the West, uh, we see patients with older, with advanced cirrhosis, and we have a more disease organ availability. So there has been more tendency to do transplant versus surgery. Versus in Asia, is you know, is again, hepatitis B, younger patients, not advanced cirrhosis, and the surgery is kind of the first treatment um, and more aggressive. You know, they can do transplant salvage, utilize and living donor liver transplantation. So coming back, if uh, all portal vein tumor thrombosis are the same, and there are different classification about this. Uh, I'm going to talk the two most common. One is for the liver cancer study group of Japan and the other from China. So this classification for Japan, they uh, define um, in five groups. So BP series like no thrombosis, BP1 is those ones distal to the second branch. BP2 is the secondary branch, normally the anterior or posterior portal vein. The BP3 could, BP3 could be right or left portal vein, and BP4 in the main portal one. Uh, comparing with the Chinese classification that they changed from 2006 to 7. Basically, they, uh, they put the BP1 group and BP12 in just the one group that is the type one. Uh, continue, you know, two is just the bifurcation, uh, three in the main one, and they include an extra group that is involving the superior mesenteric vein. So as you can see uh, in this study, utilizing the Japanese um, classification, if the extension of the tumor is, you know, is more to the main portal vein, is associated with less prognosis, life or five years. And similar utilizing the other classification, the sheet classification. So the type one, they have overall better survival than the other groups. So overall patients with minor portal vein thrombosis, they have better prognosis. So I want to show you one of the, one of the most uh, important papers about the survival benefit of liver resection in patients with HTC and portal vein invasion. This is a, uh, for the group of the Professor Kokudo, uh, for the liver cancer group in Japan, was reported in 2016. Uh, they mentioned uh, you know, patients with HEC seven, around 70,000. From them, there were around 6,500 with uh, macrovascular invasion with portal vein. Um, <clears throat> Japan have, was uh, available to have sorafenib after 2009, so not too many of these patients received that treatment. Um, less than less than five percent, and you know the overall median survival with liver section in patients with child A has been thirty four point months. So we compare it with the Barcelona guidelines where they say survival seventeen months. So you can see there are room that we we can improve with liver section. But coming back to the um, you know the Japanese study, um, just 
being the difference, seeing the difference between liver resection group versus no liver resection groups. Of course, there are difference. Patients who underwent two resection normally have a patient with a, <clears throat> a child A. Uh, they're presenting less amount of tumors. The size still pretty um, significant size, and they are less percent to have higher levels of alpha peptoprotein. And the extension of the portal vein is more common to having BP1 and BP2, comparing patients who don't have a liver resection when it's more advanced, the portal vein. However, they did a match propensity score. Uh, this is all child A patients, and they divide in liver resection versus no liver resection. No liver resection include another therapies, like uh, radiofrequency, and sorafenib. As you can see, there are no really difference in these two groups. However, in the survival with liver resections, the patients who underwent to liver resection, they can survive 1.7 years longer than the patient with no liver resections. And, you know, and seeing the evaluation for uh, the grade of thrombosis, we can see patients with a PP1 even can survive in four years. Of course, they are decrement with the time. <clears throat> and the uh, mortality for BP1 and 2 is less than 3% after a surgery. There are other prognosis factors has been associated with survival, presence of cirrhosis, size, multiple tumors, you know, alpha fetoprotein, R2 resection, and BP4. So the conclusion of this paper is that liver resection is associated with longer survival that patients with no surgical treatment for HEC, as long portal vein tumor thrombosis is limited to the first order branch. And they suggest that liver resection should be the first treatment of choice in patients with a good liver function. As you can see, there are more studies supporting this data with very good overall survivors, especially patients with a PP1 and BP2 tumors. There are a few systematic review, but I found this uh, one very interesting uh, from China, they include around 50 studies about the hepatic resection, if it's safe, uh, you know, patients involving macrovascular invasive. Include around 14,000 patients, but for me, the most interesting is that they compare about um, Asian studies versus not Asian about the overall survival patients with portal vein tumor thrombosis with resection, and they were similar in both, and the same the survival with five years. And again, there are no randomized complete trial studies checking, uh, comparing with another uh, treatments. However, I found this interesting call from Germany uh, about the impact of portal vein thrombosis on survival in HEC with different treatments. You can see patients with resection, they have, they do, uh, they have better prognosis compared with days, sorafenib uh, or another treatments. And when they um, are seeing the extension of the portal vein and the treatment with liver resection, they found that survival around 32 months, so something very similar that we are seeing with the Japanese group. And the VP2, they have a survival of 10 months, but it's much better comparing with the, another strategies. So the criteria of resection is uh, number one, to have adequate liver function reserve. Um, and uh, there are no consensus here as well. Uh, many of the group just utilize child A, because child A, you know, liver section, the overall survival at five years, 50%. And with B is decreased to 20%, so most of the child Bs are eliminated. And other groups utilize male score of nine, um, known as patients to have a total bilirubins less than one. Uh, the other characteristic patients need to have a good liver remanent. Um, you know, most of the um, Western countries, we utilize volumetry. At least we need 30% in normal liver and 40% in patients with cirrhosis. And in Asia, is um, they utilize a lot of the depuration of ICE and need to be less than 15%. And now there are some data that utilizing the elastometry less than 12. 
And the ideal is that patients should to have no portal hypertension because decrease um, the risk of postoperative liver failure. There are some indirect data, like such platelets around more than 100,000, spleen less than 12 centimeters or no varices. We can be more specific uh, measuring the hepatic venous pressure gradient that should be less than 10. However, there are a few studies that they are saying there are no contra not absolute contraindication in very selected patients with child A and mild portal hypertension. You want to describe a few um, slides about new adjuvants and adjuvant treatment for with surgery in the sense that there are a few uh, interesting papers that they describe liver resection plus some new adjuvants and the increase of the overall survival is actually very impressive. Or compared to surgical resection with taste and surgical resection as well, the overall survival is much better. So the rationality behind here is that they think, you know, new adjuvants can probably do like a downstaging is not a, it's kind of a new concept uh, with the intention to increase the receptivity in these patients. And the adjuvant therapy, uh, the intention is to eliminate micrometastasis to improve uh, disease-free survival and prolong the life of this patient. And we can utilize any of these um, um, therapies available. So the overall conclusion is that patients uh, with advanced HCC is very heterogeneous, needs a multidisciplinary care. I think the most important is to divide again patients with metastasis in a patient with uh, portal, portal vein tumor thrombosis. And patients with portal vein tumor thrombosis with BP1 and BP2, they have a benefit for surgery, especially in patients with uh, child A and no portal hypertension. I think they are in enough evidence that argues the expanding the indication of liver resection in the new guidelines. Um, hopefully there will be a revisions to be more aggressive in the surgical treatment. And it's going to be very interesting to see the future perspective with neo and adjuvancy. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Solis, for this comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, truly appreciate it. We're gonna move on uh, so we can be compliant with the time. Uh, next talk will be uh, by Dr. Travisian when to uh, refer to transplantation. Hi, good afternoon. Um, you see my screen well? We do, yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you for the uh, Society of Moderators for inviting me to present. Um, so um, we're talking a little bit about transplantation, what has evolved and where the future uh, directions are. Um, these are my disclosures. So uh, we really uh, started with the Milan criteria uh, that was established over two decades ago. And, uh, you know, no question that the uh, creation of Milan had had a profound impact on the survival and increased the cure rate of many patients dramatically. And um, there is a large database that also shows that patients who have early HCC um, uh, do better uh, with transplantation compared to uh, resection or ablation. Um, however, you know, we learned over the years uh, and as we have a better understanding of new adjuvant therapies and tumor biology that one size does not fit all. And uh, we learned also that within Milan that there are, uh, you know, a um, subgroup of patients that um, may not necessarily need an urgent transplant and others who would do poorly that are still within Milan. And the UCSF group uh, established this few years back uh, on patients who have a very low risk of dropouts and may not even benefit from transplantation, you can argue. And these are patients who are uh, at very low risk of recurrence uh, with uh, tumors less than three centimeter, alpha fetoprotein less than 20, and have complete response uh, to local regional therapy. And their dropout rates was 1.6% versus 26%. Um, so as we, you know, expanded our criteria over over years and also uh, using other indication for transplantation, I think it's important, and Mazzaferro pointed this out nicely in this paper, um, that we need to balance between the patient and transplant community perspectives, and we need to really take into account uh, the complex regional local conditions, the donor availability, as we know, donor shortage, 
weightless dynamics, uh, organ allocation, and priorities. And over time, as uh, you know, uh, the criteria is expanded. Uh, this is a, a consensus conference uh, from ILTS uh, um, uh, with experts in this field. And uh, in terms of expanded criteria, the consensus was not reached because there were just too many of them, but everybody agreed that tumor biology was important, that response to bridge therapy was, was, was key, and uh, there was a value of uh, downstaging patients to within Milan uh, and um, achieving excellent outcome. Uh, and when we came to living donor transplantation, I think the um, uh, the goal was to achieve at least a survival over 60% and include biology. So since Milan, you know, a, you know, a lot of selection criteria were proposed, and initially these criteria were based on uh, morphometric criteria. So everybody started to, uh, you know, uh, and uh, increase uh, a varying degree of of size and number. Um, Matsuferi himself published up to seven criteria. Toso looked into tumor volume. But the, none of these at the beginning incorporated tumor biology, uh, which means wait time, response to breast therapy, and most importantly, alpha fetoprotein. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to see how things evolved also in the UNOS allocation and ASLD guidelines, where we moved from morphometric criteria to tumor biology and our, uh, have changed our guidelines over the years. And I think one of the markers of tumor biology is really AFP, uh, which resurrected um, and was uh, uh, you know abandoned uh, at the beginning. Um, the Toronto group looked into this and um, you know demonstrated how AFP ad listing and transplantation mm -hmm. affect survival. Mm -hmm. Um, and here you can see if the AFP is over 500, your survival um, uh, significantly decreases uh, on an intention to treat as well as post transplantation. And this led to um, many different prognostic models, and, and uh, the French model was one of the uh, key models uh, um, early on that was published in 2012. And um, the, this model included AFP, um, uh, combining it with size and number, uh, and they demonstrated that as AFP uh, increases, your survival worsens, and when you um, include this model with tumor and size, uh, they were actually able to increase the, their, do, their pool of patients by 20%. And so 20% of patients who would have perhaps not even uh, obtain a transplantation and, 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 and be cured. Uh, and this model essentially replaced Milan criteria for allocation in France and was also validated by this large Malta international study. Um, Matsafer himself created a second metro ticket model uh, and, and called it metro ticket 2.0, uh, where also AFP was included in the up to seven criteria. And here also this model outperformed Milan alone or UCSF and the AFP model. And if you were included within this model, your survival was, was, was great. And if you were beyond this model, um, uh, your survival decreased. Uh, another model that's uh, important to point out is the East-West study that also included inflammatory uh, parameters. And here also they were able to increase the pool by 37% and achieve an intention to treat of 52%. Um, however, you know, when we looked into all these models, um, these were all like static AFPs at some point in time during the wait list. And this can range from like, you know, a few months to, to few years. And um, I think most importantly, nobody had really looked into the dynamic AFP uh, on the wait list. And uh, uh, we, along with uh, uh, my colleagues, Karim Halazun and Vacha Gopian from uh, UCLA, uh, created this uh, score uh, and we named it the NICO score, uh, where we essentially um, looked into um, the dynamic changes of AFP over time. And what we has demonstrated actually is that um, how your AFP does according to the local regional therapy or now systemic therapy makes a huge difference. So if you had an AFP at, uh, over 1,000 and was able to um, have an over 50% response, um, you did similarly to somebody who has an AFP hovering around 200 to 1,000. And we were able to recategorize uh, over 85 of patients that were outside of Milan into a low acceptable risk score um, using this, uh, this model and achieved a five-year recurrence risk survival of over 70%. And this score was also better than Milan and French AFP and was also validated in the multi-international study and was published uh, a few years back. 
Um, important to note is that um, you know what we want to achieve with uh, with with new adjuvant therapies on on on, on the wait list, and I think our goal is to achieve a complete imaging response. But also, it would be nice to have pathologic response, and this is a nice paper by Dr. Dinorcia um, that looked at complete response. Um, uh, you know, uh, not surprisingly, they did better than patients who had partial response. And it's also important to um, you know not rush patients into transplant. And, and the UCSF group pointed out uh, towards the uh, sweet, uh, you know, six months to 18 months uh, period where uh, if you rush patient into transplantation too early, uh, you would have probably captured bad tumor biology and have have, have worse outcomes. And if, if you waited long as well, uh, you would have converted uh, good biology into bad biology. So uh, wait time is also important in this case. So downstaging um, has really moved into the front line in selecting suitable um, liver transplant candidates and USF team uh, came up with this uh, criteria, which was then adopted by UNOS in 2017. And this is essentially um, the, the tumors uh, should not have a diameter uh, or some of uh, some of less than eight centimeter and with no macro, no uh, vascular invasion. And the patients who were successfully downstaged were those who had a uh, residual tumor within Milan at transplantation. And they gave it a minimum minimum observation period of three months. And when they compared this group to patients who were always with Milan in an intention to treat, they did exactly uh, the same. Um, so this led uh, us to do a large um, retrospective study, including 2,500 patients from uh, a few um, um, US centers. And uh, here we demonstrated that at 10 years, you could still achieve an excellent uh, outcome in patients who were successfully downstaged. So here, here in the red line at 10 years, your survival was 52% if you were successfully downstage to within Milan, an acceptable recurrence rate of 20%. And um, this all these studies essentially led uh, to a, a change in the BCLC guideline, which was uh, alluded to on the on the previous talk. Uh, so the BCLC guidelines are becoming very complex. Downstaging has been incorporated into these guidelines. Uh, TEAR also has been incorporated uh, along with TASE in the intermediate stage. Uh, and then a big box, which is becoming more and more complex, was created for the oncologist. And we'll see how all of this were interlink um, and, and uh, in, into transplantation. Um, in a prospective manner now, um, this is the first prospective study that looked into the intention to treat outcomes in patients who met downstaging criteria. And here at a median of 2.6 months, if you met downstaging criteria, you were able to be downstaged to within Milan in 83%, which I think is spectacular with local regional therapy. And this is not including immunotherapy at that time. And 30% um, of these patients underwent transplantation. So your probability uh, to uh, receive a transplant at three years, if you met downstaging criteria is 46%. So half of these patients could get to transplant with an excellent two-year survival rate of 95%. Um, and um, I would say the most robust data we have to date, uh, which we're all aware of, is the XXL trial by Matt Zaffaro, um, that uh, essentially, and these are not just looking into UCSF downstaging data, but these are all comers, um, uh, randomizing patients into transplantation versus control group. And, um, you know, not surprisingly, patients who underwent transplantation had a survival of 77% versus 31%. And this is probably the best level one evidence we have. Um, so this uh, takes me to, uh, again, expanding the criteria even more. Can we go beyond the UNOS downstaging protocol? So there's been a lot of debate of actually using the all-comer protocol, which was, which was used in the XXL trial. And these are patients who have any tumor size, any tumor number without any vascular invasion and giving it a minimum of six months period um, uh, to be successfully downstaged and then transplanted. And in a prospective fashion, um, this is a small cohort, but just to uh, demonstrate that you're able to downstage around 64% of these patients at a median of 3.9 months, and ultimately were transplanted 24% of these patients. And when we looked into this, uh, into their survival and compared the intention to treat of the patients who were in the UNOS downstaging versus the alt comers, really it wasn't statistically uh, uh, different. Uh, the three year survival and in intention to treat was 69% versus 58%, which I think is, is uh, you know, achieving a three year 58% survival in, in, in all comers is, is spectacular. And we can definitely do better in order to uh, increase that number. 
and um, you know patients who had an elevated AFP or had child B or child C did worse uh, compared to others. In uh, Asia and in uh, in uh, Canada. Um, this expanded criteria was uh, looked into in a living donor uh, situation, and these are the selection criteria really vary. I pointed out towards a few of them that uh, that were, uh, um, you know, large cohort studies, um, but essentially ranges, ranges from, uh, you know, uh, UNOS uh, criteria versus all comers, and uh, one of the uh, studies from, from Asia essentially compared patients that were beyond uh, Milan within UCSF to within Milan, and they had an acceptable uh, and comparable outcomes as well as the recurrence uh, of these patients. And this is really similar to what we had seen in disease donation. And talking about macrovascular invasion, which was uh, discussed earlier in our talk, um, I think we certainly can do better with transplantation in a select group. Um, macrovascular invasion used to be a you know, absolute contraindication uh, is becoming really a relative contraindication at this point uh, with the use of new adjuvant treatments. And this is a, um, a 30 patient uh, multi-international study, um, uh, you know, over a 15 year span that looked into this and were able to achieve a 60% five year survival in this select group. Um, and uh, also a acceptable recurrence, uh, um, you know, uh, recurrence rate uh, post transplantation, and um, I would say the most robust data we have uh, in living donor and portal vein uh, uh, invasion is the uh, is the um, study done by Soin, who um, essentially were able to downstage the patients with portal vein thrombus. Uh, with new adjuvant treatment and achieve a 57% five-year survival, which is, think, uh, you know, much higher than what we have seen uh, with resection. So I think in select cases, um, this is something um, to be evaluated. I know um, this will be um, discussed later in, in the talk, but, um, uh, you know, uh, systemic therapies really have, as we know, revolutionized the treatment of advanced HCC, and this is the landscape, and I'm sure in like a few years, this will become more complex, but uh, really the question uh, um, came up if we should use this in the new adjuvant setting as well and transplantation, is it safe or not? And this caused a lot of controversies, um, particularly because the first case report that was published um, in 2019, um, this is a patient who received um, uh, uh, immunotherapy within four weeks from transplantation, who developed uh, hepatic uh, uh, necrosis and died um, at, you know, at, at day 10. Um, so it caused a lot of uh, uh, concerns in the transplant community. And overall, many centers um, started to uh, use uh, new adjuvant, um, um, you know, local regional therapy plus systemic therapy in these patients. And overall, there are less than 50 case uh, reports, uh, some case series, some case reports alone um, that were uh, published. And, um, you know, just to point out that this is really a small um, cohort of patients worldwide, very heterogeneous group, uh, very different types of immunotherapies were used, different cycles were used, uh, the dosage uh, uh, prior to transplantation was stopped uh, at a very different times given the given the series. So, and the follow up also um, is is uh, may not be long enough uh, to also establish uh, oncologic long term oncologic outcomes. But I think important is to just point out that if you look at the explant pathology, uh, a lot of these patients have over 90%, not even, even like complete necrosis on the pathology with the use of local regional plus systemic therapy. Uh, and as we know, pathologic response, um, you know, uh, causes, you know, increases your outcome as well, which I think is it's, it's interesting. Um, around four patients had uh, rejection, um, and of those, uh, two died and two were retransplanted. And rejection remains an issue, and I think it's very difficult to um, extrapolate really a, a, um, a guidelines according to what we have. But there are encouraging, uh, you know, um, results that were that were seen in in few centers. 
Um, more importantly, I think it will be interesting to, um, to see what these trials uh, will, uh, will, um, will show. Uh, and these are two trials like China and, 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 and US that essentially are looking at the combination of, of immunotherapy pre-transplantation and um, their endpoints are safety, feasibility, as well as oncologic outcomes. So we'll see, I think one of the trials results will be will be uh, uh, established soon. Uh, so it will be interesting to see if we can really use this agents in the new adjuvant setting, along with the local regional therapies we have in order to, again, expand further our, our, our selection criteria. So really to conclude and to answer the question of when to refer, um, I would say things have really changed and we've been refining our selection criteria very rapidly. Um, uh, probably early um, uh, would, be, would be good, but in patients who are not resection candidate, um, I would say it will be important to discuss uh, any HCC at a multidisciplinary team uh, meeting where uh, transplant uh, plans and surgeons are also involved in order to select uh, the patients who would be suitable for transplantation and provide them cure. Um, you know, the criteria, as I said, um, is, has been, uh, you know, has evolved over time. Uh, we, we know we moved past Milan criteria. We understand uh, biologic behavior and, and we incorporating this into our decision making. I think we're going to slowly um, understand more, develop better, better biomarkers. Um, we'll learn more about liquid biopsy, gene expression, have better imaging studies in order to select our patients better. And I think immunotherapies will really um, take over. Over, over the next few years and perhaps um, be, um, uh, you know, be, be, be safe according to the trials we have as bridge therapy so we can use them along with the other local regional therapy we have in order to improve our outcome. But as I said, all these uh, needs uh, controlled clinical trials in order to um, establish uh, 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 meaningful guidelines. Thank you. Thank you, Parisa. This was truly a great presentation. Um, congratulations. Uh, I will ask you later if at Mount Sinai you are um, checking liquid biopsies to monitor these patients before and after transplantation. We'll leave it for later. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Uh, we'll move again, uh, again uh, to the next uh, talk um, by Dr. Bruno Odisio. He will give us his perspective on interventional radiology. Um, for the treatment of a paracellular carcinoma. Thank you, Dr. Adicio. Thanks so much. Can you all see my presentation? Yes. Okay, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, uh, to be again, you know, connect at least virtually with all my colleagues from the HPBA. Uh, and I will try to talk today about what are the limits for uh, local regional therapy, specifically in terms of uh, interventional radiology procedures. And uh, the message I want to try to to convey today is that we can do better uh, doing uh, some of the local regional therapies to our patients with hepatocellular carcinoma. And this will be based on three main uh, uh, limits that we need to explore. The first one is how we can do quantitative imaging analysis and how that can help us to treat those patients. The second thing is how uh, uh, we can think on a longitudinal approach of those patients because we know that uh, some of those patients, or most of those patients, uh, I, I would say, unfortunately, they do recur uh, after local regional therapies uh, with new tumors, and we need to be prepared to rescue those patients at the time of recurrence. And finally, I want to show some of the strides that our IR community has been doing in terms of research uh, to see how we can uh, also improve the outcomes of the, 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 tre the treatments that we offer for those patients. So uh, the first slide I want to show is the rationale uh, for that. And that's a paper that has been quoted uh, by Dr. Trabizian and some of you here are co-authors on this paper. But the, the point here that I want to make is that when we achieve uh, 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 local tumor control, and we optimize complete pathological response on patients undergoing liver transplant, uh, we see that the post liver transplant recurrence is significantly lower. So not only from the perspective of uh, uh, controlling the tumor before the transplant, but also seeing to portend an improvement on the overall recurrence-free survival uh, of those patients 
uh, following transplant and uh, also overall survival. So that's our metric here. We want to improve and we want to achieve as much as we can complete pathological resp response on patients undergoing transplant. And then even on patients not going to, uh, uh, to leave a transplant, as I'm going to show on the next few slides. Uh, the problem that we have with interventional radiology in general, it's uh, being a minimally invasive therapy. We're always at least 15 or 20 centimeters away from the organ or the tumor that we're treating. And we don't have intra-procedure microscopic margin assessment differently from surgery. So uh, on surgery, as you all know, if you do a resection, you can do a frozen section immediately and see if you get a positive margin or not. And based on that, you modify your treatment strategy. As in the other hand, for instance, when you do a liver ablation on a patient, we quantify the minimum ablative margin of that ablation, but that is highly dependent on a number of factors. The first one is the image resolution of the uh, imaging method you're using. For instance, a CT scan, you need to have an optimal CT scan image resolution so you can actually identify the tumor as you can barely see uh, on this example here. Uh, the second thing is the segmentation, the tumor segmentation accuracy. You need to be able to segment the tumor not only in a accurate, but also in a consistent manner because uh, 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 so tumor segmentation, it's one of the elements that you can have a lot of uh, intraoperator interoperator variability and bias, and you should reduce that to make uh, uh, the analysis that you get you know, from those uh, 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 procedures uh, more consistent. And the third thing is the registration. When you do an, uh, an ablation or a chemoembolization or a radioembolization, you need to do some registration between uh, pre intra procedure or post procedure imaging. And uh, those two elements, they are highly dependent on the software that you're utilizing to do uh, your segmentation and registration. So, uh, when we take a look, for instance, on the uh, paper that has been uh, uh, discussed on the uh, prior presentation by, by Dr. Trabizian, we can see that complete pathological response on thermal ablation, for instance, is only. Uh, 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 27%, uh, taste, 22%, taste and thermal ablation, 26%. So based on ongoing data that we have in the literature right now, we can do definitely way better than that. And uh, my argument here is that we can only do better if we standardize the way that we do the procedures and if we do quantification by imaging of the treatment endpoints on those patients. So the first example I'd like to bring uh, on thermal ablation is the stereotactic radio frequency ablation, which is a technique that was developed by my friend Rachel Bali uh, in Innsbruck, Austria. And uh, essentially what he has done is he has translated the stereotactic guidance from neurosurgery procedures for percutaneous liver ablation. And doing that with multi-probe placement, uh, we can achieve local recurrence rates uh, significantly better uh, when we do ablation of those patients. So this is particularly to HCC. It, it's a 10-year uh, analysis that he did on 195 tumors on 97 patients, and he applied SRFA as a bridge therapy to do a transplant uh, with a median time between uh, uh, the ablation procedure and the liver transplant of 6.8 months. And what we can see here on the right side is that complete pathological response was achieved in 97.3% of the tumors. Only five tumors of those uh, 188 that were available uh, actually did not have complete response. And when we dig a little bit deeper on the paper, we see that from those five tumors, two of those, the margins were not sufficient and that was detected by imaging and the patient ended up having the liver transplants uh, before they were brought back for reablation of a known area of a suboptimal tumor coverage. And the other three tumors, they were in what we call challenging locations for percutaneous ablation, such as close to the colon or to a major central bile duct. So uh, with proper patient selection and proper technique, we can achieve uh, local tumor control rates uh, of you know, over 95% or over at least 90%. So that's another paper from uh, their group where they treated uh, not only HCC, but a series of different tumors, over 2,653 tumors with a median diameter of 
centimeters. And when we take a look on uh, overall look, uh, local returns rate uh, uh, for HCC uh, on that paper was around 7%, which is in par with the local returns rate following a surgical resection. So based on that uh, series, uh, we can advocate that when properly done, percutaneous thermal ablation can achieve the same local tumor control rates from a surgical resection in optimally selected patients. And that has been reflected on the BCLC guidelines already for many years. Uh, we know that the metric of uh, survival, it's highly dependent according to the BCLC staging that the patients are. So on that particular series, uh, patients on BCLCB undergoing uh, uh, serotactic radiofrequency ablation, which is a patient population with a very advanced uh, 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 tumor burden for the IR standpoint. Uh, they achieve a median overall survival of 15 months and a five-year uh, overall survival uh, of 55%. BCLCA, uh, including patients with uh, HCC is measuring more than five centimeters, which is traditionally considered a contraindication for ablation, but using serotactic radiofrequency ablation can treat those patients. Uh, with a median overall survival of 65 months, five year 55, BCLC zero early stage HCC, median overall survival 96 months, five year overall survival 68%. So uh, proper technique equals uh, optimal outcomes. That's another study that uh, uh, a group from uh, Belgium, Belgium is uh, performing right now where they're developing and applying a new ablation confirmation software uh, to correlate the minimal ablative margin of patients with hepatocellular carcinoma going thermal ablation with local tumor progression. So that's going to be a prospective multi-center, uh, non-comparative open-label study where the primary endpoint will be a correlation between identifying the optimal minimal ablation margin associated with a local tumor progression of less than 10% of one year follow-up. So the goal here is to try to use an ablation confirmation software uh, to improve the local tumor control rates of patients undergoing uh, thermal ablation. When we go to chemoembolization, uh, we also see that uh, arterial enhancement based tumor response criteria, such as the modify resist, uh, correlates with survival not only on patients undergoing liver transplant, but also uh, on patients who are inoperable, uh, like on this paper here that was published in 2012. Patients who have complete response by modify resist, they do better than partial response that will do better than stable, then who be do better than progressive disease. And we also see a strong correlation between imaging response assessment with histological necrosis. And we all know that histological necrosis correlates with uh, uh, optimal outcomes following liver transplant. The problem right now is when we do taste, given or take, based on the literature, the complete response rate is about only 50 to 60%. So you're pretty much flipping a coin, right? When you do uh, taste uh, in terms of complete response uh, rates. And uh, we know that when we use optimal imaging guidance, such as uh, cone beam CT, which is a cross-sectional uh, CT-like imaging that we acquired during chemoembolization, uh, those patients, they tend to have a better response to the chemoembolization. And on this paper by Iwasawa, uh, over 10 years ago uh, from Japan, they showed that when you use Combin CT assisted taste, you have a better overall survival. So that really pushed the need of cross sectional imaging intra procedurally during chemoembolization to see if you can improve the overall outcomes of those patients. Uh, the problem that we have when we do chemoembolization, this is a patient that I treated in many years ago. Uh, he was initially referred for what was called a hypovascular HCC here on segment two. You can see this is a CT, arterial phase, fair amount of contrast media uh, on the aorta, but not really a vascular tumor. So we brought this patient, took about a month to bring him for uh, the procedure, and we did a CT hepatic arteriography. And what we saw actually is the tumor is not hypovascular, it's just affected the tumor seed on segment two. That's an area that takes a little bit longer for the contrast media to get there. And uh, was a quite hypervascular tumor. And we did the chemoembolization on him. We waited 45 days to see the response assessment and he had partial response. There was a little bit of residual disease right there. And it took another 30 days to bring the patient back to do another chemoembolization and then achieve the complete response. So my point is we should really move away from these 
for eight weeks imaging follow-up to evaluate the response assessment of local regional therapies that we do in IR. It would be unacceptable for a surgeon to wait one month to get the histological results of the frozen sexual intra, uh, op, uh, op, operative. I think the same thing applies to IR. We need to use quantitative imaging to evaluate as we do the procedure, uh, what is the treatment endpoint and how we can modify the overall treatment strategy of this patient based on that. So we can optimize and make them to get this complete response, optimal local, local tumor control faster. So one of the ways that people are doing that, especially in Asia, is using uh, intra-procedure 3D convinced CT or CT for quantification of lipiodol deposition. Lipiodol is one of the uh, uh, key mobilization techniques that is widely utilized worldwide. And they show on this paper here that when you have a dense deposition of lipiodol within the parasitoidal carcinoma treated with key mobilization, that correlates uh, with... Uh, tumor necrosis or contrast enhanced MRI in the first imaging follow-up. Same thing with angio CT systems. Angio CT systems is we now we have an angiography machine that is coupled with a CT on rail machine that we can do CT intra procedure with. And uh, that's what we have in our institution and what we have uh, applied. Uh, this is a technique that we have developed there. We hope, hopefully, we're, pl we're planning to evaluate that prospectively on a multicenter study. We are doing a CT scan before the chemoembolization uh, with intra arterial contrast media and a native CT without contrast uh, before the chemoembolization. Then we repeat that CT at the end of the chemoembolization. And then a software that takes about a minute, it subtracts the CT uh, of the pre. Uh, and the post all together. And based on that, it creates an enhancement mapping of the tumor. And then you can quantify not only what kind of response the, the, the tumor will have. So like on this case here, the tumor completely disappear. Uh, and uh, 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 you know that you got complete response, but you can also see what vessel is supplying the area of residual tumor enhancement in case the patient presents with that. And that's the imaging follow-up here. That you know process, has a 97% uh, accuracy when we compare with the first imaging follow-up assessment. So that's just another example here where we have this HCC before the chemoembolization. We did the chemoembolization and post chemoembolization, we don't see any tumor enhancement there. And uh, on the imaging follow-up, complete response. One thing that is also very interesting that we notice when we apply this, uh, I'm gonna call advanced imaging intra procedure is we can identify the vessel that is supplying the residual area of the tumor. So for instance, this patient had a tumor on segment one, and uh, we embolize that vessel right here after the chemoembolization. Intra procedure, we noticed that this vessel here that was not really touching the tumor, it started to touch the tumor on that area, and that was the area of residual enhancement. So we could, in theory, go back there, put a catheter, and try to achieve complete response by embolizing that tumor. Or if we feel that that area is not really possible to be treated with human embolization, we could refer that patient to ablation or for external beam radiation or to any other local therapy that would maximize the local tumor control of those patients. Uh, Y90, it's a therapy that has, at least in our institution, uh, largely replace uh, human embolization. And that's based on the recent data that we have, um, multi-center studies showing that the local tumor control rate and also overall survival seems to be better when we apply Y90 compared with chemo embolization. So that's a single center study that one of my partners, uh, Dr. Mima Vash, has been conducting. Uh, we included 40 patients uh, on this, patient, on this uh, study, single center, tumors measuring three or more centimeters. Uh, uh, so they were not uh, eligible for ablation by, you know, initial definition. And we apply what is called a patient-specific voxel dosimetry treatment plan. So the goal was to maximize tumor exposure to radiation of at least 200 gray and try to keep the normal liver less than 100 gray. And the primary endpoint was localized modified receipts overall response at six months follow-up. That's the interim primary endpoint analysis. We have overall response rate of 96%. Uh, with 21 patients, baseline tumor diameter 4.6. We had patients with 
tumors measuring three centimeters up to 9.9, .9, and the median dose 325 gray. So we can uh, achieve objective response at six months at, on this interim analysis of 96%, complete response at six months of 56%. So that's uh, one final slide I'd like to show about the criticality of planning from the initial treatment of those patients uh, to maintain as much as you can of a functional liver remit so they can be rescued at the time of a tumor recurrence. So that's an analysis that we did focusing on patients who had a relatively advanced stage of their disease. They received either Y90 or they receive external mean radiation on institution. And we analyzed the patients who, after had, who had intrapatic progression, the ones who went straight to systemic therapy versus the ones who receive any kind of salvage therapy at the time of the progression. And when we compare those patients, granted that there is a significant bias on the analysis of those patients, but we use a inversion pro probability weight uh, statistical analysis to try to overcome that bias. We show that when we, are, when we rescue the patient uh, who had progression here in green, they do significantly better than the patients who progress after initial radiation therapy and did not receive local regional therapy. So the point here is to receive subsequent local regional therapy, you need to maximize the amount of normal functional liver that you have on those patients so they can sustain sequential local regional therapies when the recurrence occurs. So in conclusion, uh, I think the limits for IR-directed therapies on patients with heterocellular carcinoma, uh, they will be uh, broken, expanded based on quantitative imaging analysis treatment endpoints. Uh, I think when we do quantitative Im imaging analysis, we're gonna improve the local recurrence free survival, but also the overall survival of those patients. Uh, I think the longitudinal local therapies are required for most of the patients with heterocellular carcinoma, and we need to be very intentional and very thorough from the beginning of the local therapy of those patients to try to maximize local tumor control while we're reducing the, uh, the exposure of the normal functional liver to the local therapies we apply. And we, as a society, as a community of interventional radiologists, I think we are really making strides in the last 10 years about what kind of research we're doing and the clinical significance and how we can uh, establish our practice based on evidence um, based on medicine. That's it. Thanks so much. Thank you, Bruno. That's a wonderful talk. Uh, congratulations on what you're doing there at MD Anderson. Thanks. Um, we're going to move on into the last talk by uh, Dr. Sunil Kamath, who is one of our um, precious medical oncologists here at uh, Cleveland Clinic. Thank you, Sunil. Okay, can, can you see this okay? Yes, wonderful. Great, yes. So I'm going to summarize uh, the emerging systemic therapies in HCC in about 15 minutes. So we'll, let's, let's hustle. <laughs> um, so first-line therapy, fortunately, has really come a long way. Um, we were stuck in the dark ages with serafinib for about um, until lenvatinib came around in 2018. And lately, it's really been an explosion um, in immunotherapy combinations. So you can see first uh, atezolizumab arrived in 2020. And then very recently, we now have two other options as well, dervalumab and tremolimumab, or what we will refer to as the stride regimen, uh, and then dervalumab monotherapy as well. So really great you know, to have a number of options in the toolbox. So I'll start out by discussing uh, the Embrave 150 study. This is what led to the approval for atezolizumab. Uh, this was a trial for untreated patients with advanced HCC, and they were randomized to either atezolizumab or serafinib. And the primary endpoint of the trial is overall survival and also progression-free survival. You can see here this are the, uh, the the key efficacy outcomes as far as response rates. You can see about a 27% response rate with atezolizumab versus about 12 with serafinib. And importantly, if you can see that there were about five and a half percent that had complete responses, and so these are those. You know, exceptional cases where we're seeing, you know, complete resolution of tumor and something that uh, was just unheard of with TKIs alone and really leads to our ability to think about a number of things we never used to think about. Sunil, sorry to uh, interrupt you. Uh, are you trying to advance your slides or, or 
Oh, you're yeah. I, oh, on, I am. Yeah. You're on the first one. I'm on the first one still. Okay. Let me see. Maybe I'm sharing the wrong. Hold on. Okay. I'm going to stop and maybe come back in. That's probably just the regular mode, right? right. Um, do, you see, do you see efficacy data now? No. I, I At least I'm not seeing your, uh, your slides. Okay, Jeez. I guess I got, I got booted too. Okay, all right. We got you back. Yeah, let's try that again. Let's see here. Okay, now do you see efficacy data? We do. Okay, great. All right, let's try that again. Um, so yeah, so this is the uh, the key efficacy data for um, atezolizumab versus serafinib. So you can see again, response rate of about twenty seven percent versus twelve. And uh, complete response is seen in nearly 6%. So really, you know, something that's exceptional that we do often use to try to convert patients to resections and even transplants as well. Uh, these are the survival outcomes. You can see um, in the first panel, progression-free survival was significantly improved, uh, 6.8 months versus 4.3, and overall survival also improved to nearly 20 months, uh, which with serafinib alone would have been truly unheard of. Um, so really, it was a game game changer for us. Uh, this is a patient of mine. He was a 78 year old gentleman. He initially presented with right shoulder and right upper quadrant pain. Uh, he was found on imaging to have a very large uh, right hepatic lobe mass. Uh, he has preserved liver function and does not have cirrhosis. Um, his AFP at presentation was significantly greater than 13,000. Uh, this is his initial imaging. So you can see, you know, near replacement of the majority of the right hepatic lobe and innumerable pulmonary metastases. Um, so his biopsy showed HCC as we had expected. Um, so I started him on, on a TZOBEV, um, and you can see with his imaging after three months showed, you know, truly a, a dramatic response, uh, you know, greater than, you know, an 80% reduction of his primary tumor and the liver, um, and also significant improvement and even resolution of numerous of the uh, pulmonary metastases as well. Uh, this was his AFP trend. So you can see from over 13,000, he normalized within just you know, a couple of months, um, has remained so. Um, and you know, really the great part about these treatments, you know, in addition to having these exceptional responses that the toxicities and quality of life on these are often excellent. This gentleman gets his infusions with me in the morning and goes to the golf course every afternoon after that, um, has a perfect quality of life and lives really you know, a, a normal existence essentially, which would not have been true um, decades ago. Um, so this is the newest kid on the block, the uh, Himalaya study. Uh, this was a trial, again, for untreated uh, first-line advanced HCC. There were three arms in this trial. Um, the stride regimen of dervalumab and tremolimumab, dervalumab monotherapy, and then serafinib. Um, so just uh, for the audience to know, so the dervatremi is a you know, PD-1 plus a CTLA-4 combination, and dervalumab is PD-1 alone. Um, and you can see the uh, primary endpoint here was overall survival. And these were the outcomes that we saw. So you can see that both arms, the stride combination and Dervalumab monotherapy showed improved outcomes compared to serafinib with a median overall survival of around 16.5 months versus 13 and a half with serafinib. Um, what remains to be seen really with this is, you know, how much really is the CTLA-4 drug that the Tremi adding? You can see the medians are extremely similar. There do seem to be some separation of curves if you follow patients out to three years. Um, you know, three year overall survival is about 6% better with the stride combination versus Derva monotherapy. Um, so it remains to be seen, you know, really will that continue to be true with further follow-up or not? Um, but again, great to have a combination, you know, that is both dual IO and avoids uh, the bleeding risk that can come with bevacizumab, um, which is a very real consideration when we're talking about uh, patients with cirrhosis and, and HCC. Um, so this is our, our first line treatment landscape today. Um, you know, 10 years ago, this slide would be just serafinib. Uh, now we have five different potential agents. You can see probably our most efficacious is atezolizumab. 
um, has the best you know, median overall survival and response rate. Um, but it's nice to have, you know, sort of multiple combinations. We all know that with bevacizumab, it comes with a significant risk of both bleeding and, and thrombotic events. Um, so it is nice to have some options that do not have bevacizumab involved and may spare people that risk for those who have significant cardiovascular comorbidities or um, varices, et cetera, or other risk for bleeding. So the second line space really has become kind of a desert now. Um, we have, you know, basically a number of, of TKIs such as capazantinib, regorafenib, um, and then VEGF monotherapy with ramsirumab. Uh, technically, there are still these approvals for pembrolizumab and then nevo ipi in this setting, but really, if anyone is eligible for immunotherapy, they're going to get it first line now. So I can't really envision, you know, patients that we would use these in anymore. Um, if you look at this is a table just summarizing, you know, the efficacy data for these. Unfortunately, you know, very weakly, very modest effect, modestly effective agents, response rates in the five to ten percent territory. Uh, improvements in survival of, you know, two to two and a half months. So, you know, really a space that has a significant unmet need and uh, one that I hope, you know, we'll have something more efficacious in soon. Uh, one thing that we were very excited about that this was just presented nine days ago at AACR. So this is adjuvant therapy now for HCC, a space that really um, so this is basically um, a randomized phase three study looking at a TZOBAV versus active surveillance for patients who undergo uh, resection for HCC. Uh, they included patients that were high risk disease. Um, so you can see the criteria that were used here. Uh, those who had, you know, a small number of tumors, but larger tumors or those who had, you know, a larger number of tumors, but smaller size or with uh, poor differentiation or uh, macrovascular invasion. Uh, these are the, the data that we're seeing. Um, I know the baseline characteristics of the table is quite small, but what I really wanted to call out here is that 71% uh, of the patients that were included in this trial were in Asia. Um, and as a result of that, 62% of those um, had hepatitis B. So definitely some concern as far as the generalizability of these data um, to a Western European population or US population where um, we have a lot more patients with hepatitis C or NASH, um, significantly more cardiovascular comorbidities and obesity, um, certainly, you know, may limit the generalizability of the efficacy data and also makes me worry a little bit about the safety as well. You know, our population is typically at higher risk for, for bleeding and arterial thrombotic events. Um, you can see the efficacy data here. This is relapse-free survival. Um, you can see there was a significant improvement at 12 months of 78% were relapse-free uh, versus 65 percent uh, with active surveillance. Um, so still very early data, I would say, you know, I, I am a little bit concerned if you look at the curves here, they do cross as you get out to two and three years. Um, so it remains to be seen, you know, are we really delaying recurrences with this combination or are we in fact preventing them? Uh, very few patients have made it to two and three years of follow-up yet, so it's still a lot to learn from this trial. Um, but still, you know, very exciting to have this as an option, you know, in, in space we really have not had anything in to date. Um, so there's a lot of future directions, you know, immunotherapy has been truly exciting for us. We've had a lot of cases where we've combined um, systemic therapy with local regional, with SBRT for patients, you know, with very high volume multifocal disease with macrovascular invasion and being able to use a new adjuvant approach, converting them to resection or even transplant, um, you know, things that we just would never have thought about 10 years ago. Um, for us, you know, in the, in the medical oncology space, you know, I think can we sequence, you know, these immunotherapy combinations because they're really our, our most active agents? Um, and there are also a, no, a lot of novel therapeutics um, in the pipeline as well. Um, STAT3 is, is a newer target for us, uh, which is really exciting to have a, a genomic target unique to HCC, which really has been unheard of to date. Um, this agent TTI-101 is in development. We'll be participating in the, in the trial here at Cleveland Clinic. Um, so we're excited to see what that will show. And there are also a number of cell-based therapies, NK cells, engineered CAR T cells as well. Um, so really a lot of exciting stuff going on um, in, in medical oncology for this disease, uh, which we did, would not have been able to say some years ago. Um, and that's it. Thank you for, uh, for having me give this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. As uh, usual, uh, great talk. So I think we can go ahead and uh, open this uh, floor for discussion. We have a few minutes uh, remaining for for questions. Um, I have I have a few questions. Um, I have a question for uh, for Parisa. I I kind of mentioned it before. I wanted to hear from her. What's her 
experience, uh, if they're utilizing liquid biopsy in the liver transplant population at, at Mount Sinai, and if they are in which, in which capacity? Yeah, I mean, this is a very good question. I think that the leaders in this have been Augusto Villanueva and, and Josep Lovet. Um, I think we have done more work in resection and transplantation. You know, they, we, we, we looked into this and looked at the, at the studies that were published on liquid biopsy and transplantation, and really there are less than 20 studies out there. So I think the, uh, the data is very limited. Uh, there is definitely highlights the uh, prognostic value of you using uh, liquid biopsy, but um, we know there's really no established guidelines. So we haven't been using it uh, routinely for transplant, but we have had a lot of experience in our in our resection cases and our uh, non-resection cases as well and who were diagnosed with HCC. I think there's definitely some room for improvement and understanding, but I, I would say in the next few years will be definitely um, be part of the decision making and 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 selection criteria. Is is it uh, modifying in any way your your practice uh, or no. not yet? No, no, yet. not yet, not yet. I don't think there is enough data to 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 uh, to change our practice yet. Gotcha. Thank you, um, Karen. A quick question for you. I wanted to ask you. Uh, you talk about uh, resection in patients with portal vein uh, uh, invasion, and in those cases, do you do resection up front or you do? Uh, let's say radiation and systemic therapy and you observe and then you take the patient for, for resection? So yeah, this is a, you know, a very good question. Uh, I think there are like the new evidence is showing that you know, if you're doing some kind of neoadjuvants, actually the patients do better in receiving some radiotherapy or taste and then or the, um, undergoing for surgery. Um, I mean, most of our patients, uh, you, you know, in, in this part, we are, um, we don't have too many liver resections for that, but I think that in the future, that's going to be more the perspective to receive some neoadjuvants. you combining that with uh, systemic therapy, both radiation and systemic therapy, so what you, what you guys doing or looking to, to do in the future? Yeah, I mean, we are using more like a Y90, uh -huh. uh, BRT, and see the patients kind of have down staging to proceed. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, it's, it's, uh, the responses, some of the responses we've seen with combination of radiation and immunotherapy are, are just uh, uh, amazing. And uh, also um, observing over time, the stability of that treatment right before committing to, to uh, surgery. I think that'll be key in the, in the near future. Uh, Bruno, I have a quick question for you, if I may. I wanted to ask you, so you kind of sort of mentioned why 90s kind of overtaking uh, uh, the, the taste. And so I wanted to ask you, when do you opt for one over the other one? What would be the indication for why not you over uh, the taste or the other way around? Thank you, Federico. I think we, you know, that, that comment I made needs to be taken into consideration uh, based on the referral pattern that we have in our institution, right? We are a quaternary cancer center. We don't have a liver transplant center here. Mm -hmm. So typically our patients, they are more on the advanced stage uh, in terms of not necessarily vessel invasion in a, a, a liver metas uh, meta extra metastasis, but they have a fair large tumor burden when we do not apply ablation and we have to decide between hemembolization and uh, radioembolization. So I, I think based on our referral pattern, we tend to go more towards the radioembolization procedure than the taste. Uh, before practicing here, I used to practice in a liver transplant center and their taste was the modality of choice because you can repeat many times and uh, you know that you follow patients for you know a few years until they receive the liver transplant and they need to you know again salvage those patients at the time they recur. Uh, it's uh, uh, really important. The other point that I would like to make is uh, you know radiobolization, it's a very successful uh, procedure in local regional therapy, but it's a, it's a treatment for the riches, right? Uh, when you go to a developing countries, you know, paying forty, fifty thousand dollars for a Y90 treatment is not really feasible. And chemo embolization has its value and its place uh, or, on such circumstances as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm not. My point is, I'm not uh, opposing to the chemo embolization, but just that the pattern that we saw in the last few years in our institutions, we're using more and more 
Y90, but I do feel there is a place for human mobilization in general as well. And how about the, the use of Y90 uh, to, uh, so to do a, a, a radiation lobectomy, not only to treat the tumor, but also induce contralateral hypertrophy uh, you know, before, before resection? Yeah, so we, as you know, we are a PV center, right? We, that's our uh, uh, modality of choice to provide hypertrophy. We have recently, Dr. Ching Wei Zhang has opened a, uh, uh, a study, single arm, I think, uh, evaluating liver hypertrophy on patients with colorectal liver metastasis, not HCC, uh, uh, to evaluate exactly that. But we don't apply that on clinical practice uh, as of now, because the timing seems to be something that we don't really know how to do that yet. In other words, uh, when you do a PVE, you know that in four weeks, you're going to have some, in over 90% of the patients, you're going to have sufficient liver hypertrophy. Uh, with Y90, it might take a little bit longer. So it's a balance, right? It's like uh, 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 Dr. Pinier de Trabizian mentioned, you want to test the tumor biology, but you don't want to wait too much. So we are still like learning about that as of yet. That's right. That's right. Um, Sunil, could you elaborate a little bit on if there is anything uh, to elaborate on? We may not have that information yet, but I'm always curious. Do we have any um, biomarkers uh, that are predictive of response to immunotherapy? Yeah, that that continues to be a challenge, and you know the the short answer is no. You know, really, I think. Um, we have three that we widely use in, in other tumor types, um, pdl one status, MSI high status, um, and, and tumor mutation burden or TMB. Um, certainly, you know, MSI high, if you have an MSI high HCC, which is probably about 0.5 to 1% of patients, we would expect a better response in that population, you know, similar to you would in other, other solid tumors. Um, but the other is really, you know, TMB, pdl one expression, um, you know, people have looked at in interferon gamma release assays and, and various things, and you know, largely they have not been predictive in the way that they are, you know, in, in non-small cell lung cancer or melanoma. Um, so that continues to be, you know, something that I think we really um, need, you know, a better understanding of because, yeah, the majority of patients, unfortunately, are not going to respond to immunotherapy and, um, you know, identifying them early certainly would be, would be helpful. So there's no... Uh, necessary role for pre-surgical tissue biopsy to look at the uh, these potential uh, histologic, in this case, uh, molecular uh, uh, biomarkers in HCC. There's no no role for that yet, I guess. Correct. Yeah, it, we certainly still do it. You know, if someone has you know clear extrahepatic disease or clearly never going to be a transplant candidate or you know resection candidate. Certainly, having tissue to do NGS sequencing is, is, is great. You know, we, we try to do that in everybody. But this does largely ends up being sort of genomically silent disease. It's rare that we find targets with it um, that are truly actionable. So I would say, yeah, we're not, we don't tend to find very much with that type of testing. I guess we have to uh, wait a little bit more to, to, uh, to get that information. Thank you. Um, Dr. Diego Davila, any questions? Uh, Dr. Uh, Ruiz, any questions? Actually, I have a lot of questions. Go ahead. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, uh, first, uh, I, I would like uh, to start with uh, Dr. Karen Pineda. Uh, she did a wonderful presentation. And um, when I went to Japan, uh, I saw many um, sections for HCC uh, with compromise of the um, portal vein. However, um, resections for um, IVC are more uh, infrequent. So um, do you have any experience uh, about uh, resections for patients with a compromise of the IVC? Well, for HCC, no, not really, to be honest. So it's kind of a more kind of contraindication. When we do resection for the IVC, it's normally for another kind of tumor, so like a leiomyosarcoma, but not for HEC. Because I, I'm asking because, because eventually when we are doing a, a right hepatectomy, um, it is not that infrequent to find uh, compromising of the IVC that was not detected on, this, uh, 
on the previous MRI or the CT scans. So I wonder if there is any room for those kind of um, patients to have um, local IVC resection, perhaps? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think perhaps it's, um, you know, I think still, you know, one is technically doable, but the other is, you know, the risk of, you know, complications or, or extension of the tumor. So again, I think the, the evidence showing that it is, uh, you know, very localized portal intramorphosis, they do better. But, you know, even people are doing, you know, IVC resection and putting graft. Uh, I mean, I think one thing is doable, but it's kind of the uh, oncologic results are really there. I think those patients that you are mentioned, there could be great to give them some new adjuvants. So make the tumor, you know, smaller and then proceed with the surgery. Okay, okay, very good. Um, I think, sorry, sorry, uh, uh, Diego, I, um, I think we have, um, we have one last minute. Okay. And okay. So, so we have to wrap up. I know Dr. Vega was asking for the panel in general who wants to answer, uh, is there any formal indication of what, in what circumstance we, we would order uh, or try to obtain a biopsy before treatment in a paracellular carcinoma? I mean, I, I personally think that, uh, you know, we've been uh, um, trying to uh, not biopsy anybody at the beginning, like years ago, but I think we're moving to an era where we should biopsy patients upfront at diagnosis to better understand the, uh, the, uh, the disease. Um, so I would advocate of doing it upfront, uh, particularly because the techniques that we're using now are have very minimal seeding. So yeah, that, I, I feel exactly the same. Uh, there's always the concern in the past about uh, seeding, but I think that the technique has improved, as you mentioned. And um, I think we're changing, or we'll be, we will be changing uh, a lot in that in that regard. We'll, I think we'll be doing uh, many more biopsies, right? Dr. Ruiz, any questions? Yes, for Dr. Karen, uh, in stage B, of Barcelona classification, uh, there is a contraindication to liver to partial hepatectomy. What is your opinion? Because there is enough evidence that it's not the best option to these patients. The question, uh, sorry, the question was for, for who? For Dr. Karen Pineda. Dr. About the treatment of Barcelona B stage, multinodular tumor. You, you are muted, there you go. Yeah, I think it's a, you know, it's a very um, interesting question because uh, I mean, some people having done it, you know, to do it a resection for multinodular, especially if the, you know, in the, all the tumors are kind of close by, you know, you have a bigger tumor, and multi-centric, so another small tumor is less than two centimeters, and you can take it in the uh, anatomic resection. Uh, so again, I think there are literature from Asia that they do it, and they have a reasonable uh, results. Uh, I will not say it's a complete contraindication in those patients. I would also argue, like, you know, if you have multinodularity in one lobe versus you have multinodularity in bilateral lobes, you know, I think it makes a difference too. Right. That, that, that is true. I, I think that, you know, for those cases in general, you want to apply uh, before surgery some sort of therapy and you want to observe. I don't think you want to give a patient a big operation and then a few months after surgery, find out that the patient has a recurrence. So with all the tools, non-surgical tools that we have, including local regional therapy, all these systemic therapies that can keep good control of this disease, um, I think that, you know, doing it upfront and kind of observe how the disease is behaving in those circumstances, I think it's important before moving forward with, with upfront uh, surgery. All right, guys, I, I think we are uh, at the top of a time. Uh, I, I really want to thank all of you. These were all wonderful presentations. I wanna thank all the participants and um, I hope we uh, continue doing these sort of uh, events in the near future. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.